I'm gonna, I'm gonna open one of these because I have a feeling I'm gonna need it. I just chugged a coffee before I came up here. Surprise, surprise. Uh, thank you, Cyrus, for that introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Everyone says, like, this is my favorite show of the year. This is actually my favorite show of the year. Um, seeing it get this big, seeing the team here, seeing what you guys did is just awesome. And then seeing the community here and the customers here, it's really great. So um, I'm talking about one of my favorite topics, customer loyalty. It's something that when I was here a year ago, I was talking a lot about. I was talking about what you test and what marketers should be paying attention to. And one slide that really stuck out last year for me was this idea of saying thank you. And how do we say thank you as a marketer? Um, how often do we do it? Do we test it? How authentic is it? What mediums do we use? Uh, and when I think about the last year and I think about all the things that I've doubled down on or the things I've wanted to learn more about or you know, the late night you know, Googling, reading, consuming, uh, this is it. It's that idea of the thank you building customer loyalty, how to do it right, how to use the skills and channels that we are so well versed in that we love to do this effectively and, and to just really connect with customers. So I have a lot of slides like everyone here did. Uh, so I'm gonna try to run through them real fast, but uh, they'll be available after so you can check them out. So let's kick right, you know, jump right in. What is brand loyalty? I went with a very emotional definition. Surprise, surprise. Loyalty is when brands create an intimate emotional connection that you simply can't do without ever. I love the finality of it. I love the language choice. I love that it's an emotional, intimate connection. And if you just look at this, you're like, that is hard. It is very hard to do. There are so many touch points and so many steps and so many places to go wrong. And this is what we're after. It also brings in more revenue. We're here because we, we work for companies. We have to make some monies, right? We have to pay some salaries, and, and it's all part of that too. 80% of your company's future revenue will come from just 20% of your existing customers today. That's crazy. When you think of the last decade or so and how much time we put into acquisition and finding just sheer volume of people, where are they playing? Where can we be that they can find us, right? The inbound marketing philosophy. And then you think to yourself, you've got them here, they're doing something, 20% of those will represent 80% of your revenue. That should stop us, and just that, sh that alone should point out how important it is that we give this time. But there's a huge problem right now as marketers, what we've done in the past and where we're going in the future and what will be expected of us. Loyalty is built one-to-one. -one. It always has been, it always will be. Dave and I, we have a connection. I love Dave from Moz. And our loyalty is gonna be built over many moments across time, one-to-one. -one. He needs something I deliver. I need something he delivers. We laugh about something, we connect, we hear each other's stories, one-to-one. -one. The challenge is, we don't live there anymore. The platforms that exist to us, the tactics we use, the way we do it as marketers, we're one-to-many. We're expected to reach the masses, hopefully a highly targeted, effective mass, but still, like, the masses, that's what we're trying to do, right? The idea of virality and getting everything to go further. The markets are, are more fragmented than ever. For there to be a conversation to happen between a brand and a customer, there's a hell of a lot of noise. You think about just what used to be there, and then different mediums of communication, and then mobile, and then you think about different mediums and the idea of video and how we can communicate stories so effectively and connect with someone, and then competitors jumping in, and then they can catch momentum, more momentum faster because there's more tools to help them succeed. And it gets real noisy. And we have to find our way around it, but we have to kind of use some of these, but then we have to know which one to use and what to spend our time on. And we're all operating lean. I've never met a marketer that had too many design resources or too many devs available to them. So we're trying to figure out where we should be and what's the most effective to reach that customer and get them to connect with us. It's a challenge. It's not even the biggest problem. That's like a whole problem. That's like a serious problem. That's not even the big problem. The big problem is companies will not succeed without loyalty. This was not the case before and it is absolutely the case today. I know Rand talked about brands yesterday. I know you've heard about brands in a lot of the conversations. You're only gonna hear more about them. Building a tribe, building a loyal audience, building something with customers that exists beyond a purchase is a requirement, it's the new standard. There is this idea that a sale could have happened in the past if you just had what someone needed. And I think as marketers, we spent a lot of time, you know, early 2000s, like thinking about, late, late 1990s, thinking about this idea of, I just wanna make sure that they know I have exactly what they need. When I think of PPC when I started in it, I just needed to make that ad copy say what we had and do it well 
and then make that landing page relevant and show them what I had. That was enough. Then everyone got, everyone leveled up, everyone started doing that, everyone figured that out. And so we got to this point, they needed to have a unique value differentiation. You need that UVP. What's special about you? So then as marketers, we're like, all right, I'll do that. That's a great story to tell. I'm gonna make it more beautiful. My user experience is gonna be gorgeous. Or maybe like Aaron, the customer service is what we're gonna invest in. And we're gonna have great help documentation and they're gonna love us for it. Maybe it was your price. Maybe you undershot a market. Maybe you offered it in a unique search way or, or comparison or something beautiful on site. You did something that had you stand out, and then everyone else caught up, and then we were all leveled up again. And everyone offered something great in a unique and beautiful way. And that's why we're here. That's how we got here. I'm not sure how long we're gonna hang out here before everyone levels up, but I can tell you there's a really open field right now to play in, and it's pretty exciting. So this idea of turning the conversation back to that customer, getting insanely customer-centric, and doing it across all your channels, every campaign you do, every word you write, Everything you track being about that customer and their satisfaction, like Cyrus mentioned in the rankings factors, is huge. And it is everything we should be talking about and focusing on when we're doing our day-to-day -day activities as a marketer. So what can we do? Make it our damn business to start. I don't know how many people I talk to, they're like, I'm not a brand marketer. That's not what I do. I'm not on the customer success team or the customer service team. Product handles retention. It's merging. The teams are changing, the titles are changing. Every one of us, whether we have it as a bullet under our job descriptions or not, we should roll into work in the morning and ask ourselves how we can make the customer happier. For many reasons, but one of them being loyalty. And so we need to make it our damn business, and we're gonna talk about some of that today. There's some things to know. There's an actual way to build this. This isn't magic. I also hear that a lot. Well, it'll just happen if we chip away at it and we do it right over the years. No, I mean, maybe, but like very small amounts. Not as much as if you're intentional. And that's the great thing, is marketers are intentional beings. We like to do things, track it, improve it, right? So we're good at this. So we're gonna talk about these six steps. I do wanna call out this, because I think it's really important to note. There are currently, you know, there's four types of loyalty, customer loyalty. It's just good to be aware of, and we're gonna talk about which one we're really focusing on today. So there's a no loyalty bucket. There's a group, a cohort of your current audience, your current lead base, your current customers, that just really won't have an affinity to a brand. It's just the way it is. I wouldn't necessarily say that you should try to focus on getting them over to be loyal to you in one of these other buckets, but I do think it's really important to measure what size that is and to track it across like a control group, right? It's just important to know. Inertia loyalty, this idea of a low level of brand attachment, but they buy out a habit, so they often purchase you know, many times. We all are very familiar with this, this idea that we go to a store and I'm like, I don't really know what brand it is, but it's good and it's always there, so it's nice and cheap and I buy it all the time. So that's the type of loyalty. Good to know what percentage of your audience does that. Latent loyalty, high brand attachment buys less, less often, usually like attitude-based. Think to yourself, I might only buy a car every three or four years, but I always buy Toyota. My family, Toyota trucks, it's crazy. It's like a commercial in my driveway. So if you think about it that way, again, great group to know how big they are, but are they gonna be a huge part of your daily activities, your daily marketing campaigns? How's that gonna work? Is it seasonal, is it annual? This last one is the one we're after, premium loyalty. High brand attachment, high repeat purchase, and that beautiful third sentence, pride in purchase. These are the crazies. These are like our gold mine, right? This is everyone that's ever been a part of Apple. Andrew Dumont's somewhere in the room. He's the pride in purchase for Apple, right? And if you think about that, these are the people we should be going after, and these are the people that we should be thinking about how we can just keep them excited and let them go on their way. I mean, the momentum around these people is already so beautiful. We just need to fuel it and give them the tools they need to run with it. So thinking about that, it's really important. So I'm gonna jump right into the six steps. I think this first one, we've heard a lot about in the last couple years. We all understand the difference between selling the how, the what, or the why. I wanna talk about the idea of a brand story because a year ago, I got up here and I was real crazy about the idea that we should be using our websites more effectively to tell our company's story. And I'll be damned. Like, Everyone, I mean, like seriously, I saw a shift. Like, I feel, I feel like sites got better with their home pages, better with their about team pages. They started selling the why. Why are you in business? Why are you special? And they did it beautifully. Uh, what I would like to challenge all of us to do is think about how we can do it off-site. How can we get into a room with all of the creatives that we normally use to think of ways to get traffic or conversions or uh, upsell opportunities? How can we take all those creatives, throw them in a room and say, figure out sexy ways to tell our company's story. 
Give them money, give them time, give them devs, give them all the things that they need, and then run campaigns like you would any other way as a marketer. Track them, optimize them, improve them, innovate on them year over year as they start to hit market saturation. Think about that. That's what I think is what is the change this year versus last year when it comes to telling our brand story, doing it more off our site, taking that conversation to the public. Coca-Cola does an amazing job of this. We know their, their mission as a company, share happiness. It's a global mission around happiness. They did this great campaign between Pakistan and India where they just put in like Coca-Cola machines but they were virtual. Does anyone know this, this campaign? It was, I mean, I get shivers just thinking about it. Um, they put up Coca-Cola machines and it's like a virtual and I could wave to someone in my neighboring country and they would wave back and the whole point was just to be like, sometimes a hello and a wave is like all you need. And you think about how much money they spent both in planning, implementing, executing, and then sharing press around this, the social media attention and time that that team put into this. It was huge. And it's all because they really want to show that they are that dedicated to happiness. Important. Wistia does a great job of showing their brand personality. It takes time. It takes an entire team to manage these platforms these days. And they're saying to them, take half your day, like, we, like Moz does with Megan, take half the day and spend it capturing this team's awesomeness and share that with our customers. Start those conversations. Wistia does a great job. It's hard to type on softball days. He's like typing with his men. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. Also, they, they, I mean, they have a softball team, it's just funny. So I can attach myself to Wistia, I can see them, I recognize them when I see them on the road. It's great stuff. Number two is connecting with customers in new ways. So I think we're really good at um, <clears throat> finding our customers, knowing more about them than ever before. Uh, and this one is this idea that we're using our platforms to ask them questions. So we've been giving surveys for years, we've been getting insights from that for many years, on-site tests, surveys via email. We should be using the platforms to ask them questions, give feedback in immediate real-time action, and connect with the customer in that way. Cupcake Royale did a great job going to the summer of this year. It's a local company. They just asked, what flavor do you want? There's lots of berries and delicious food in Seattle. What kind of flavor cupcake do you want? And it kind of went crazy and they jumped in and then the customers picked it. And when you think about that, and then you think about that compounding and how important that can be, it's huge and it's so easy to do. We're conversational beings. Marketers are really good at this. We want to know information and we're really good at talking. So these are great things to do, right? So asking questions, getting feedback, being transparent like custom with your customers like never before, transparency, it is the new standard. It is not a phase. It will not go out of style. Rand is literally smiling, right? Like, it's so true. This was an amazing campaign. Do you know what McDonald's did? So this is the Canadian marketing lead for McDonald's. She did a video. She answered the question we've all always asked, why does the burger look different in store versus when you show it on TV? And for three minutes, she reminded us just how much they lie to us. She was like, and we Photoshop this, and that's not real, and this isn't real, and you would never be able to eat that, and no, and no. And I'm just watching it, and I'm like, God, I love McDonald's. I'm a vegetarian, so that's like really awkward. But I, I mean, if you think about the fact that I'm committed to them because they're transparent, I now have a connection with her. She represents the brand. Maybe if I'm driving through town, I've got a couple of people in the car late night, I wouldn't think a bit, but I might stop at McDonald's just because I feel better about their brand. But she, she told us for three minutes transparently that they lie to us. But she just said, hey, you asked, so here's the answer. That sort of transparency, oh, balls to the wall, very exciting. Take the online relationship offline. People have been doing this for years, but there should be more of it. So Red Bull, I tweet at them. You know, we go back and forth a couple times in a couple days. They send me some Red Bull and a great adventure video offline. I am not a Red Bull loyal customer. I have literally bought more Red Bull since like, getting this and talked about them more than I ever thought I would. Um, and not just in presentations, they just seem to come up more. And that's that affinity, right? Like that's that front of mindness. Um, I, I advise on a company down in Australia and he was saying that one of his customers has literally listed every bug for him. He, he rolled out an MVP and a lot of things went wrong and he just keeps sending him bugs. And he's like, this guy's like on my product team. And I was like, have you sent him something? Like offline, like a thank you? You know, if you sent him a shirt, like a staff shirt, that'd be hilarious. And I think that we should just be thinking like that. There should be a budget for it. There should be conversations around it. You should be planning for it quarterly. That's the sort of stuff that we as marketers need to shift our attention to. That's brand loyalty marketing. Anticipating needs and asking and adding value before they ask. So this is everything inbound marketing is, right? And I, and I love that. I think that more and more marketers understand it intuitively. So that's great. Um, I think that we can use the mediums that we're playing on 
and maybe we're using currently to get traffic or get links or get visitors or conversions and think what else can we be using them for to build that brand loyalty. So Julep, a local beauty company, does a great job of this. Explore new product ideas, explore new content ideas, figure out what they're excited about and start delivering on it proactively and get them excited about you. And it's, it's like a win-win all around. They used it, they built some boards coming into summer, one around weddings, one around Caribbean, one around July 4th. The Wedding Bliss board obviously did very popular. People were pinning different colors, they were pinning combinations of the beauty products. This is what I'd like to see. And then they built a wedding suite section on the site, drove conversions, drove revenue, drove repeat purchase, drove brand loyalty, circled it back, started pinning these combinations to the board. It's great. So thinking about how you can be doing that for your brands. Curating what they love. For, I mean, the hardcore SEOs, this is so intuitive to you. For a lot of us, it took me a while to think I need to take time and I need to be curating great content out there for others that might not even be mine, but it's an ad, it's a value to that customer, and they'll appreciate it because I'm saving them time, and that's, you know, it, it's a lot, you know, for someone like from a performance background to think that's how we should spend our time. Uh, Charlotte is the marketing manager over at Big Door somewhere in the audience, and she, I mean, when I met with her, this is one of the things I said, I was like, where do I go to read about this new industry, this industry I'm entering that I want to, like, in, you know, envelop myself in, and she's like, there's no one curating this stuff, and I was like, ah. You know, and she's like, this is a huge opportunity for us. This is huge. It is a great way for us to start spreading that thought leadership and connecting with people on a greater scale, adding value before they need it. So spending time on this, again, telling your content team, if it takes you a day out of the five you get every week to curate great content, it's worth it. Delivering on promises, Lowe's nailed this so well. So is anyone familiar with the Lowe's Fix and Six? It's such a good campaign. It's the idea that you do what you say you're gonna do. It is the core of one-to-one -one loyalty. You promise something, you better as hell deliver it. When Vine came out, Lowe's could have very easily put out six-second videos about anything, I don't know, the team meetings or in-store things, but they didn't. They returned to what they've always said as a brand that they were going to do. They showed us quick home improvements in six seconds, they built a campaign, they called it Lowe's Fix and Six, great. Viral, people send this all over the place. And it happens to rhyme, so weren't they lucky? You know what I mean? So if you think about that, how can this, these new mediums come at us and we say to ourselves, let's build some campaigns and test? Start with returning to what you promised you were gonna do. Don't start playing in the crazy stuff just yet. Like that's discovery, that's exciting, exploratory marketing. But you made a promise as a brand. Everyone here works for a company that made a promise, start there. I also say being there in the good and the bad, uh, this, is a, this is like a tough one. I think, because we're brands, but we're people behind brands, therefore we're actually people in front of brands now, you know? And I think that when something goes bad, like the Boston uh, Marathon Challenges disaster, um, Southwest Airlines, New York Times, they're setting the new standard here. Because I think for a long time it was okay to go quiet. And maybe it still is. There's a lot of politics involved in a lot of companies, and sometimes it's the right thing to do to just say, we're going dark today. I do think there's a new standard. I think we need to be human before we, be brand, we are brands. And I think that this sort of stuff, reacting, just saying like our love is going out to you, we're thinking of you, saying it over and throughout the day, the following day we're still thinking of you, just being like human before you are that company representative, I think will become what's expected and I think that you see when people start to go quiet, it won't be as well received. Better received than when you're ridiculously stupid and say wrong things, but still not as well received as if you proactively engage in what's happening in this world. Uh, number five, being consistent. Staying front of mind. So this is really interesting to me. I get asked all the time, I wanna be in all the places and do all the things. Where should I start? And I'm like, well, you can't be in all the places and doing all the things, but you can be T-shaped, right? That idea that you're spreading wide and you're playing in a lot of places, but you have yourself deeply rooted in maybe one medium or one platform or one channel. And you should think of your marketing like that when you're thinking about brand loyalty. Brand loyalty takes a lot of touches. It takes a ton of touches, frequent touch points, to have an impact. So you need to do that in a platform, really uh, do it successfully, and then possibly move on. You can't be frequent touch pointing on all the channels at all the time. So I think Standard does a great job of this. They could be in many places. They're a highly visual hotel brand, very sexy, very hip. Instead, they've doubled down on Tumblr, which is really smart for them because there's a lot of artists on Tumblr. There's a lot of hipsters on Tumblr. And it's every single day, multiple pictures a day, they're posting things at their hotel, customers are all these things. Music, musicians that come in and out, very smart. They've doubled down on the one that most closely 
uh, relates to their target audience, but that's the one they've started because they know that there's some brand loyalty there. So let's just, again, fuel that fire. This is the idea, right? This is everything mobile, everything Ashley loves, right? It's this idea <laughs> of uh, multi-device integrated touch points. It will be hard to build brand loyalty if you only exist on one of their devices. I would have loved to have been in the room for the History Channel's marketing team when the guy raised or a girl raised his hand and was like, we should come up with a Foursquare badge. Like, I bet that guy was like, <laughs> I don't know. You know, like the whole team is just kind of like, uh, sir, mm, we have so much we need to do, or lady, we have so much we need to do. But think of how smart that was because they have moved. And you get this badge because you discover great historic things in a town that you're traveling to, which is travel, which is historic and historians, and it's all very connected and it makes a lot of sense. So you need to be thinking about those very big leaps, right, and how you can make them. So number six, seems so obvious, it is so hard, making it personal. You need to put your customers in front of your logos, next to your logos, all up around your logos. You need to put the customer everywhere the customer should be recognized. And this is hard. Dunkin' Donuts does a great job of this. They use their social for this. Fan of the week. You think about how many fans of the week can they have in a year? We all know that, right? So like, think about that, that's not that many, but it is worth it for them because every time I go, my face isn't up there, but I'm like, God, I love Dunkin' Donuts. I miss the East Coast. Get me back there. You know, there's something about it. And so you keep that. You make that bridge in your mind. Beta Brand, they're another foundry company. They do this so well. They have literally built a program called Model Citizen. And all it is is if you buy their clothes, you get to take a picture, send it in. They will not retouch it. They don't use real models. They will put you in, your news, in their newsletter on social. They will put you on the homepage. You could be the brand for days on end. They have literally handed over the keys to their prime real estate, and that is insane. I also think that it is exactly what is happening. No wall between me and the brand. Between the customer and the brand, there's nothing there. And that's what I think is the new type of loyalty, this fifth type of loyalty that has emerged called reciprocal loyalty. It's something we haven't seen before. And it is so exciting to me. I literally love it. And we have spent so much time on the customer being loyal to the brand. How can we make it deeper? How can we make it last longer? How can we have them share it? It's all about this now. How does the brand become more loyal to the customer? How can we spend more money on this, more time on this, more energy? Every meeting, every day, every quarterly goal should have something to do with the customer. It should be the start of the conversation not the end of the year thank you campaign. So this reciprocal loyalty is really interesting to me. That's a lot of stuff. You get a lot more than brand loyalty when you focus on this, and I love to run through some of these. One, all of this, if you spend some time on it, I guarantee you're gonna have a mirror on your company mission, and we all know how important that is. It is impossible to focus on the customer without asking yourself, what do we stand for? It's great. It's a great uh, you know, secondary conversion for all of this. Teams stay invested in the customer, therefore they stay invested in each other. Uh, we listened to um, a lot of people today, really, and Karin specifically, talk about how important it is that there's cross-communication and teams work well together. And when you think about this, you need to give them something to focus on together, a cross-departmental goal. The customer is that goal. They've always been that goal. We forgot it somehow, but it's always been there. So let's focus on that. When I showed these slides to a colleague, he said to me, I asked him, I was like, what do you think of my six steps? You know? And he was like, they seem kind of squishy. And I was like, squishy? I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm a hugger, like I'm a lover. Like maybe they're a little soft. They're trackable. They're 100% trackable. There are KPIs for this. We're really familiar with a lot of these. So you need to be aware of these. You might not be responsible for reporting on them specifically in your job, but you should be reading the Weekly Digest that responds to these. So the idea of how many of your users are anonymous versus registered? How many of them are in a loyalty program? How many of them, like how often do they come to you and how, what's the latency between those visits? You're thinking about your percent of customer retention, percent of customer attrition. If you're in SaaS, it's voluntary versus involuntary churn ratios. Net promoter is evolving, it's getting better and more valuable. Um, RFM cohorts is something Renee worked on a great deal at Moz, one of the most brilliant retention marketers I've ever worked with. And it's this idea that you have recency, frequency, and monetary values. You make an equation, you come up with cohorts, you can track them across time, you can campaign, uh, target them. It's really brilliant. 
this exists. I'm not going to sit up here and lie to you and tell you that it is as easy to attribute brand affinity or brand loyalty as it is some of the other things that we are well versed in as marketers. Not the case. But I will sit up here and promise you that it will be the case one year from today. This is the evolution of analytics. This is where people are going. There are a lot of people trying to solve this. There are two startups in Seattle right now trying to solve this. There's a startup out of Boulder trying to solve an evolution of the net promoter score. We will have this at our fingertips in a year. Might as well get used to it and comfortable with the formulas now. So let's wrap this party up. As a marketer, do you have a customer loyalty strategy? You're going to need one. It's part of the game now. It's the most significant shift in the ecosystem that we have seen as marketers. People will fight me on this. But I truly believe that we are now expected to care differently than before. We're expected to track different things, use our platforms differently, our channels differently. We're expected to have different goals. Our job descriptions are changing. That's a significant shift for us on top of everything else that we've always done. This is not instead of. This is now part of all of it. This is one of my favorite quotes. This is the first time in history that word of mouth has become a digitally archived medium. And I think this is very important when you think about customer loyalty. Back in the day, a small business owner, customer comes in, they buy something from you, they shake a hand, and it was, it was almost enough, right? And then they would come back, and you'd be like, How are the fa how's the family, how are the kids? Oh my god, did you see this? This is new, this is exciting, this is hilarious, that's fun, I'm having a hard week, things are rough. All of that happened offline. And maybe that loyalty was built, and maybe that one person told three people, and maybe those three people told their families, and then it would stop. But that's all happening online. We have the platforms available to us to not only do that at scale, but archive it, improve it, test it. It's great. It's our dream. It's like we get to tell great stories, communicate with people across platforms, that go global, and we get to improve across the whole thing with great customers. I think it's just so fun. The last thing I'll say is like transparency, it's so important and I'm really thankful for my time with Moz, I'm thankful for my time with Rand and Sarah because both personally I'm very thankful that I now understand transparency at a different level but professionally I'm really impressed by marketers, all of us in the room and how we've kind of just grabbed it and like gone with it and that's hard, it's a vulnerable place to be. Uh, we need to get personal with our customers and the people that keep us in business. That's our number one goal now. And the best part is, I actually really think that's what we should have been doing all along. And I think we did it at the beginning, and I think things got crazy because we started caring about algorithms and bots and traffic and all these things that were expected of us. And now we're back to it and it's full circle. And we get to wake up every day and ask ourselves, if I have some money and I've got some cool people around me that care about their jobs and we're gonna go do great things, what would be the coolest thing we could put out for our customer today? And I think as a marketer, that's, that's all I ever want to do, and I think that's what most of us in the room want to do. So that's what I have. Um, I did put up my information. I love talking about this stuff, so feel free to reach out. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Uh, we're, oh, no, stay up here. We're a little over time, but I think Sorry. we have time for one question, if you want to move over here. No. Yes. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joanna. Your presentation looked great. Hey. And the echo is weird. Um, is the echo? This no, echo or that echo? For me. <laughs> We're um, in it together. Yeah. It's reciprocal loyalty. Thank you. Let's see what's happening there. Um, my name is Mike, Mike Marshall. I'm with Namify. Um, we're a brand manufacturing company, so we make the lanyards, name tags, shirts, whatever. Um, I'm wondering what your feelings are on what that physical product plays for a brand and how they establish their appearance to their customers and how the physical product. I know it's a little different because it's We're not We're gonna need to have a beer stuff. to talk about this, this whole thing, no. That's <laughs> a, I mean, it's, it's a real question. How do you take, I mean, if I'm hearing you correctly, how do you take something that's tangible, right, they might not be holding yet, get them excited about it, build loyalty once it's gone to them? Is that what I'm hearing, like something that's tangible? Well, it's just, yeah. Like we advertise through Google, through whatever, but another channel is, you know, you put your logo on swag, you put on a shirt, you put it out there. Like what role to you as a chief marketing officer does that, you know, putting your logo on something play yeah. in your advertising? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So what you're touching on right there is brand identity. And I think, too, often a lot of us work for companies, and I, I certainly have in the past, where you say to yourself, this company isn't like inherently sexy. Like maybe my logo or like what I, it doesn't feel like it's something as beautiful as maybe, you know, the new MacBook Air or something. How can I get them, uh, you know, excited about that? Or how can I represent that really effectively? Uh, I think for me, when I think about that logo and that brand identity, I look at it more holistically, right? And I talk about this a lot. Funny enough, I'm talking about this a lot right now. Uh, thought about it, I was running through insomnia last night thinking about this, but like what your colors are and your fonts and your logo, that used to be a brand identity. I think what now you're talking about the team faces, the adjectives you use, how people respond to you, maybe even coming up with that customer advisory board, five or six people that you know really understand your brand and asking them what those adjectives are and then taking their words and making them front and center in your messaging. I think it's gotten bigger. So I would say for you, like, I don't think any of us ever succeeds because we have one great logo or we have a great brand identity. I, don't, I mean, it's a great first step. Many of us have done pretty well and evolved along the way, right? So I, I think that that's one thing to do, but I would go into a room and I would take the, the stakeholders in your company or the whole company if you can and just ask them, like, what is the bigger story around our brand? And then I would start breaking that into different campaigns and start seeding that the way that you're seeding this, this one brand identity campaign. Does that make sense? I would just make it a little bit wider and a little bit more holistic than probably just focusing on that one piece. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Joanna. Thanks.